Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I'm very happy to have Matt Clement with us today. Hi, Matt. Hi, Frank. Thanks for having me. Well, well, thank you for being willing to talk about your really lovely article, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, Matt, where are you located at? What's your, what's your geolocation? Um, I am just south of Baltimore right now. I work in DC at Carnegie EPL. Um, okay. Kind of Jim Chase side of DC, but mm -hmm. uh, live just south of Baltimore, so Maryland. All right, very cool. And uh, how is uh, how's your summer out there on this July twenty second, twenty twenty one? Yeah, the summer's been fantastic. Um, cool. It's hot, uh, but it's you know it's been nice to finally start to get back out, and start to see people. Uh, yeah. We're doing, we're starting to do. Uh, some a few in-person events on campus most importantly friday beer hour is back in person outside awesome um, gives everyone a reason to come in a couple days a week so things are nice. uh, back in the swing it's great nice so do you uh i see that uh, musical instrument over your right shoulder there. do you play that during beer hour or otherwise no um yeah i've been I've played for years i do not play as much as i'd like to anymore I played since high school. I played in different bands through high school and college, and um, so the whole electric setups in in the basement. And it, you know, now that I'm an adult and married, and you know, <laughs> I get cranked up to eleven very very often. But uh, yeah, I'm having a hard time figuring something out. You know, I just grab the one behind me. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And the uh, cranked up to eleven says a little something. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reference over there or somewhere there. Very cool. Uh, so, uh, so Matt, what do you like to do for research? So um, I'm mostly interested, I, I study planetary dynamics. I'm mostly interested in dynamics in the solar system, the formation and dynamical evolution of the solar system, though recently starting working with uh, some exoplanet systems as well. Most of my PhD research was on the formation of the solar system's terrestrial planets. Oh, cool. um, okay. And I continue to work on that. Um, but recently, like we'll get into it, this paper, um, gotten interested in uh, the Kuiper belt and the extreme trans Neptunian objects you know, um, and different solar system uh, mysteries that, that understanding their populations can, can help us to potentially solve. This paper that we'll talk about today is it's on the Planet Nine hypothesis, which has you know got a ton of press and ton of uh, ton of attention in the recent literature. Um, so we started looking into this a couple couple years ago. Uh, we had a past paper on it, and then um, this work that we've been doing now. So it's it's kind of morphed from a side project a couple years ago to a big focus of what I've been uh, been studying. So, yeah, yeah, that is but, a. Uh... That's a common path. Oh, we'll do a little side project, a little quick, quick thing a few years later and 30 pages later. And here you are. Very good. So that is going to bring us very naturally to this really lovely AJ article on stability of Neptune's distant resonances in the presence of planet nine. And Matt, take us away. Awesome. Well, I guess we can just start by unpacking each piece of that that title. What are uh, Neptune's resonances and what is Planet Nine and why are they important? Um, so as we all know, beyond Neptune, um, most people know of Pluto, but there's a lot of Pluto-like things um, out there. That's why Pluto got demoted. Pluto is just one of many um, objects in what's known as the Kuiper Belt, uh, a kind of circumstellar disk of Pluto-like icy things outside of Neptune's orbit um, that we know now extends further out in what's called the, the scatter di scattered disk. Um, so the Kuiper belt itself goes, goes fairly far out, um, several times the distance between Neptune and the sun. Um, and, and Pluto is another great example for the next component of this title, Neptune's resonances. Uh, many of these Kuiper belt objects um, are in orbital resonances with Neptune. Pluto is the prime example. The first one we discovered, Pluto is in a what's called a three to two mean motion resonance with Neptune. So Pluto goes around the sun exactly two times for every 
three Neptunian cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this configuration is stable. We think it was Pluto was captured in this orbit very early on in the solar system's history, and it will continue. They'll continue doing this dance um, in, until the end of the solar system, effectively. Um, it, it's stable for reasons that we'll get into in the future, but there are many more resonances with Neptune. And, and why Neptune so important? Um, pretty much everything, dynamically speaking, gravitationally speaking, um, you know, the objects like Pluto and other Kuiper objects, they, they feel the gravity of, of obviously everything else in the solar system and all the eight planets, but really, you know, Neptune really drives their dynamics and, and this, um, this linear kind of series of distance resonances with Neptune going out into the distant Kuiper belt really kind of sculpts the dynamics of what's going on. So there's other resonances like two to one, three to one, four to three, um, other, other mean motion resonances. And we think, you know, around half, um, plus or minus of, of the objects in the near Kuiper belt are in these resonances and, and understanding uh, the, the proportions of objects that are in resonance versus not in resonance helps us understand what happened in the earliest uh, periods of the solar system. And, and in particular, understanding the further out resonances because as we go further out in resonances and we go further out in distance from Neptune, um, these objects Interestingly, even though they're they're further from the sun, they still come close to Neptune. Pretty much everything, but really like five or so objects that we've everything we've discovered in the in the Kuiper belt and the distant Kuiper belt um, comes within ten astronomical units of Neptune. So they're mm -hmm. perihelion. Their closest approach to the sun is with a, within about forty AU. Okay. Now. That means axiomatically that as you go further out, their, their orbits become more eccentric and more elongated. So we have two important things here that we can use to unpack what happened in the early solar system. These things are trapped in these resonances. So how did they get in these resonances? And they also have these very, very large eccentricities. You just put something in orbit around the sun. It doesn't get a large eccentricity on its own. It has to encounter something. And in this case, it encountered Neptune. So. A lot of what we know about the solar system's history, and in particular what Neptune has done, how Neptune has migrated um, since it formed, is inferred from understanding the Kuiper belt, understanding the, the eccentricities of these objects, and understanding um, the distribution of their resonances. So that's the title, the left half. Then there's this Planet Nine thing, right? So I, I talked about how um, Everything but about you know a half dozen objects that we have discovered so far, they have perihelia, their closest approach to the sun, less than about 40 AU, yet less than around 10 AU from Neptune. So this is close enough to when, when they come close to Neptune, um, when they come the closest approach to the sun, they they feel a significant force from Neptune. Ne Neptune really governs what they're doing. Um, now there's this other subsample of oddballs, the most famous of which is Sedna, which was uh, discovered in the early 2000s, right. um, that, that contradict this trend. Sedna, the closest it comes to the sun is about 80 AU, so like almost three times the distance of the sun, uh, the, the, the distance between Neptune and the sun. So it doesn't come that close to Neptune at all. It doesn't even, you know, as far as it's concerned, Neptune doesn't exist. It's just out there on its own. And since then, we found a few more of these. Yeah. Um, so these things, you, you do not produce things that, that detach from Neptune in this manner in any kind of known, you know, many of our conventional ideas of how the solar system formed. So this population of objects with these, what we call detached perihelia, perihelia that, that do not come close to Neptune, um, contradict the, the general trend of everything else we know. And as we started to discover more of them coming to around um, like 2014, 2015, 2016, all their orbits, if you just looked at them from the top down, they, they all looked like they were pointing in the same direction too. So that their orbits not only are, are detached from Neptune in this way that doesn't you know, fit any other trend, but they also appear to line up um, in a way that does not fit any, any trend. Now there's a lot of debate about this. Um, it's a it's a popular been a popular topic in the literature over the last five years or no whether this alignment itself is even uh, statistically significant or not or it's just a product of the fact that you know our surveys only point in certain directions. 
Okay. Uh, that's, you know, we, we stay out of that debate in our, our paper. Um, but one hypothesis for how you get these objects with detached perihelia, they don't come close to Neptune at all, and orbits that seem to align in physical space is if there's a additional planet out there. And this, this idea actually goes back to, um, well, the idea of additional planets goes back hundreds of years. People have always tried to propose a more to, to explain what we don't understand in the solar system. But um, the idea of an additional planet to detach perihelia went back to when we discovered Sedna. So there's papers back in the early 2000s explain, trying to explain Sedna's detached orbit with a perihelia of like 80 AU um, with an additional planet because perturbations from something outside Neptune could, could pull an orbit out. Um, so that, that idea of an additional planet resurfaced as we just started to discover more of these. So, so now kind of the general Plant 9 hypothesis is supposes that there's this additional planet out there with a mass of like five to 10 times the mass of the Earth okay. that's on an orbit such that, you know, these, these objects are effectively opposing it, it's shepherding these orbits into, into configurations um, that, that, that yeah. are gravitationally favorable, effectively. Um, like that. So that, that's where we are now. That's, that's, that's kind of the, the introduction to the topic. We have you know, a, a debatable number of objects that are in this regime where they're, they're not close enough to Neptune for Neptune to really govern everything they do, but they're, they're not far enough out like in the, in the Oort cloud for yeah. forces like uh, passing stars to really affect their trajectories. So in this, they're this in-between problem, this, this planet nine problem. Yeah. Um, so now whatever it's, it's an arms race, I guess, to either a find this additional planet, um, which it remains undetected or find additional ways to try and constrain this hypothesis. So that, that's what brings us to the research we were doing. We're effectively looking for other signatures that mm -hmm. I, I might be leaving. Very um, good. Cool. So were you going to ask something? Sorry. No, very good. Cool. Yeah. So you know, that brings us back to Neptune's resonances. As we talked about, not only, you know, not only can the eccentricities of these objects and how, how close they come to Neptune or how far they come to Neptune help us constrain our hypotheses of what's going on in the solar system, but also um, whether or not they're in resonance with Neptune. So the question we asked effectively is, if we think as you go further and further out into the Kuiper belt, um, all these objects should really kind of cluster around Neptune's dominant resonances, okay. how far out do you have to go before Planet Nine starts becoming more important than Neptune's resonances. Okay. So, you know, if it's rather than looking for more Sedna-like things, which if Planet Nine is out there, there's surely tons of Sedna-like objects that only come within yeah. AU of of this the Sun that are very very hard to detect because they never come close at all. Right. What if we can start looking for things that are more in this? intermediate picture where they, they come close to Neptune, but they come far enough out to where maybe wow. Planet Nine could start start messing with their orbits. So we effectively started to study each successive resonance going out from, from Neptune. So starting with, you know, two to one orbital resonance objects that go around one time for every two Neptune cycles, three to one, four to one. And we think theoretically um, the further you go out, it's the, the end to ones um, and the end to twos that really dominate the dynamical picture because the, the resonance themselves start to overlap and it's those, those higher order or those, those you know, dominant end to one resonances that, that are really where objects want to cluster. So, so we set up some numerical experiments getting into the methods section of the paper um, to, to just do a very simple test. We put a whole bunch of objects in each successive resonance and do one batch of calculations where we have a planet nine model and one where we do not and see how they are different. Got it. Um, so the way we study these, uh, this type of problem is with the numerical integrator that people use for all sorts of different types of 
of dynamical problems and dynamical astronomy. So we just kind of use conventional uh, numerical in integrators that people have been using for 30 years now yep. um, to, to calculate the paths of objects over, in our case, we're simulating for billions of years. Um, okay. So we, okay. we, we set up the solar system. We, we kind of ran through, you know, how we think Neptune moved around after it formed, um, which is kind of a, a, a model that has been used before to explain Pluto-like objects, to explain the, the close Kuiper belt. So we ran Pluto out like we thought it was supposed to, and we put a bunch of objects near these each successive resonance so we could capture a bunch of objects into resonance. And then we let the let the simul let the computer do the work for us yep. for a billion years and then and looked at what happened different between the planet nine simulations and the not planet nine simulations. Okay. Um, so the first one we want to look for is resonant objects. So there's an example of this, I guess the first picture of the paper, um, figure one. We talked about um, the reason these resonances are, are important, like in Pluto's case, for example, is that um, they're stable for the life of the solar system. And one thing you might know about Pluto or you might remember from, I think, the 90s when uh, that Pluto actually comes within its eccentric orbit. It, at some point, it comes closer to the sun than Neptune. It, it actually crosses Neptune's orbit. And that's why Pluto is such a great example for this, this type of um, phenomenon, this type of object, that even though Pluto crosses Neptune's orbit, the configuration itself is still stable because whenever, you know, whenever Pluto is coming on its closest approach to the sun, Neptune is always going to be on the other side of its orbit. And we call this a, a phase protection mechanism, right? And we can, oh, I love that term. Yes. You can, you can, for any of these resonances, you can, you can break down kind of a critical angle that an angle between yeah. different angles in these objects orbits that it's going to kind of be constant in order to establish this phase protection. We call that the resonant angle. Um, so it's basically just a critical argument that tells whether an object's in resonance or not, whether this phase protection is locked in or not. Okay. Um, so we can calculate this throughout our simulations. So we, we simulated hundreds of thousands of objects. So again, we tell the computer to look for these resonant angles uh, throughout the, the simulation. And then we, we just run some tests to, to search through all our object to see if they're resonating or not. And you're seeing some, some examples here of the type of behavior um, that we see in this case in the, the 12 to one resonance, which we're showing in our example. So okay. you can have objects that just lock into resonance immediately, like in that second panel, and they stay resonant for hundreds of millions of years before just something something happens, they just happen to get a little little kick, and it knocks them out of resonance. And and as soon as that phase protection is broken, okay. immediately that resonant angle goes away. Okay. You can have objects, you know, that take a little time and get like in the top panel or the fourth panel. It takes a little time of Neptune migrating to kind of sweep them up into resonance. They get closer and closer, and then they, they drop in. Okay. And we also know, um, which is what's being shown on the, the bottom panel, that particularly in these distant resonance, these distant resonances, um, yeah. objects can can sporadically jump in and out of resonance. This has been known for for 15 years or so now. Mm -hmm. um, that's some papers in the, the early 2000s. Um, so so we kind of classify this as intermittent behavior. Um, so we had some cutoffs for what we were going to call a resonant object or not, but really where you draw the cutoff of whether it's, you know, in resonance for 5 million years and out for 50 million years or back and forth, however, however you make that cutoff, as long as you do it consistently for all our different sets of simulations, you know, we're going to get kind of the same, same answers out. So the first thing we looked at is, well, are we going to have more, like in the planet nine simulations, will you have m more objects that are in, in resonance or more objects that are not in resonance compared to the other simulations? That's what's being shown in this next plot, figure two. And 
we try, I, I always try in papers to, to keep colors consistent throughout the papers. Yay. We just talked about that. Yay. To the best of my ability, as we continue through the paper, red is always going to be planet nine. Okay. Black is going to be without planet nine. And, and there really aren't a lot of differences in this, this figure between the, the red and the black. And that's, even though it's kind of a no result, that's important. That, that's saying that for the objects that are that are located around these resonances, whether or not you have planet nine out there or not, about the same fraction end up in resonance versus those that are not in resonance. Um, so so the, the answer to the first question effectively is no. Having planet nine out there doesn't mean objects can't be in resonance, right? They can still fall into resonance. You still, of the, the fraction you have out there, um, you still have about the same same fraction that are in resonance to the, the fraction that are they're outside of resonance. And we looked at a whole bunch of different ways we could break this data down. Looked at the end of the simulation, beginning of the simulation. Um, it was it was pretty much all the same within within air. So the next question, and I uh, skip forward here to to Figure Five when I talk about this. I'm with you. Big. The next question is okay. So if we have the same amount of objects that are in resonance compared to not in resonance. Well, well, do we have the same amount of objects out there, right? Does, does planet nine, if, if, it, if it's not stopping things from resonating, is it starting to deplete the resonances themselves? Is it taking objects inside and outside the resonance and, and taking them away? And the answer to that turned out to be yes. And, and fairly dramatically as you get further out. So, we're looking at two examples here of what we had, you know, thousands of examples that are, that are showing you what is happening to an object that starts off in resonance and then planet nine rips it out of resonance and rips it out of the closed solar system. Okay. So the top panel of these plots is the same as in that first plot It's the resonant angle. So yes. if it is, you know, not random if it is defined near near an angle that's, that's telling you that the object's in resonance. And the second panel is showing the object's perihelia, so how close it comes to the sun. Okay. And like all TNOs, you know, these these start out, they stay close to Neptune. They stay within about 40 AU. Okay. Fourth panel is showing you the inclination. Um, that's a little important. And then the fifth panel um, is basically it's a it's a it's a secular angle with planet nine so it's it's showing it's basically a measure of the the interaction with planet nine that causes these objects to to align the shapes of their orbits okay um, and it's really what what's being measured here we're literally looking at the difference between um the angle if you were looking top down at the problem the angle of uh, planet nine's orbit compared to the angle of the object's orbit. So this should be, you know, if there's no important resonant interaction between these objects, it's just going to circulate between zero and 360. When it starts to, as you see, around 400 to 800 million years in that first example, and really for the final 400 million years in that second example, as it starts to just loop back and forth around zero or 180, that's where there's a secular interaction, a dynamical interaction between planet nine and this object that's causing the orbit to, in physical space, oppose planet nine. And that, that also has the effect of pulling the object's perihelia away from Neptune. So as you see in yeah. both of those plots, once you start to get planet nine pulling that, that bottom angle, to, to circulate it around 180 or, or zero, mm -hmm. start pulling those objects away from Neptune and, and basically pulling them out of the solar system problem and making Sedna-like objects. And we find that this process, it doesn't just happen efficiently for the non-resonant objects of Neptune. It happens efficiently for, in this case, the resonant objects with Neptune and it dislodges them from resonance. So you see, wow as you start to inflate the ex the the perihelia in that second panel eventually mm -hmm. you get beyond about 50 55 AU where it gets 
so far from Neptune that it, it just drops out of resonance. Um, and in both cases, that resonance is broken in the top panel and, and it's gone. It, it's okay. not getting back in it anytime in the future of the solar system. Wow. Okay. So, so what this is telling us is that, you know, as, as we get far enough out, which, which we find is probably around the, the 11 to one resonance, the 12 to one resonance around 150 AU, um, which in the subsequent uh, parts of the paper, I'm going to show you that we know of objects like this. You're not necessarily stopping things from being able to be in resonance, but you're just continuously depleting the population. Okay. Um, so I'll skip forward to figure six to basically show this. Again, we are plotting the Planet Nine simulations in red and the mm -hmm. non-Planet Nine simulations in black. And now we're just looking at the total constituency, how many objects are in each resonance yep. over time. And if we look at the, the solid lines, okay. you'll see that in the close resonances, three to one, four to one, five to one, there's almost no difference. Right. Planet nine or no planet nine. And over a billion years, we're really only losing like 3% of the objects. No. As we start to get further and further out, those lines start to get further and further apart. But again, is this something at the six to one where in a billion years, it's a 2% difference. And we only know of, you know, a handful of objects we're ever going to really put a, a meaningful observational constraint on this. No, not really. But as you start to get out to the 13, one, 13 to one and the 14 to one, we start to see more like a 10, 15% difference in the overall population in these resonances after a billion years. Okay. Go forward um, to 4 billion years. Yes. Uh, the age of the solar system now or four and a half billion years. This could be very, very significant. We would expect to see as we go far, further and further out, if there is a planet nine, we should see a drop off in the number of objects out there in the vicinity of these resonances um, with Neptune. Mm. So then I'll actually go back backwards in the paper and, and okay. show another angle of what's happening here and figure four um, should be the figure, yeah, right before that one. Yep. And you know, why is this why is this happening? Where are these objects going? So again, we're looking at each resonance and again, planet nine is in red here. And you see that in, in all cases, yes. the black line in the center is kind of where we start all the objects. And in all cases, these things do spread out. You do you know, lose stuff in the vicinity of the center of the resonance. Neptune kicks things around. Yes. But the difference is, as you go further and further out in the planet nine simulations, you start to develop this this population of objects in the corner of the plot, which we're plotting objects semi-major axis, so their distance from the sun against their perihelia, their closest approach to the sun. So you, you're getting that behavior where you're just pulling the, the, these things out of the, the solar system problem to where they're, you know, in many cases, you have lots of objects that are attaining perihelia of like 100 of you. Okay. So, so that's what's going on here. So now the, the next question, is what can we do with this or what can we do with this in the future? So now I'll move forward again to figure seven. And here we are looking at all the detections of trans-Neptunian objects out in this regime where we would expect this crossover to be. So okay. five, even 10 years ago, this, this plot is effectively empty. You know, it's it's amazing how how fast you know the, our knowledge of the Kuiper Belt, and by extension, our knowledge of the early formation of the solar system has has changed in the past ten years, and, and even in the past thirty years. Right when people were first trying to trying to understand what's going on with the Kuiper Belt in the early nineties, we knew of Pluto, and then a couple other things, and even um, when our more uh, contemporary theories were being developed in the early 2000s, you know, the, the population of objects, even in like the three to two resonance, the, the, the most populated resonance that Pluto is a member of was in the, in the twenties. And now it's in, in the hundreds. 
Cool. And this is going to continue to uh, to expand as we enter the era of LSST and we begin to have all sky surveys that are that are probing even deeper. And a lot of teams are already starting to work um, with these type of data sets, uh, like teams that are working on the uh, the dark energy cam data set, finding ways to, to probe deep and deep and and populate plots like this. Now, you know, is it is it going to revolutionize our understanding of the solar system to go from knowing of a hundred Pluto-like things in the three to two to a thousand? Maybe not. But is it going to revolutionize our understanding? of the distant solar system to going from, for example, you can see here two things that we, two objects that we know of now in the vicinity of the nine to one to maybe 10 or 20 in the future, in the, in the future, you know, decade or so, mm -hmm. we're arguing yes. So at, at, <coughs> at, at present, you know, it, we just don't have enough data in this, this region to, to make a convincing argument that there is or is not a drop off somewhere in here where planet nine has ripped everything out. Yes. But we're arguing that, you know, as we, we move forward into the era of LSST, this is going to be, this plot is going to be an important plot to watch to see if planet nine has been ripping stuff out of this region or not. Yes. Uh, so nice. we, we decided to kind of finish up, you know, our analysis because this, this plot, you know, has changed drastically even in the last five years. A lot of these objects have been discovered in the last five years and no, no one's really looked at them, um, looked to see if they're resonating with Neptune or not. Um, so since, you know, the, a lot of these were discovered uh, by Dark Energy Cam, a lot of these were discovered by the uh, OSIS survey. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we decided to, to look and see if any of these are, are resonating with Neptune because it was kind of the, the point of our paper and it seemed uh, we would be missing something if we just left this plot there and didn't say anything about uh, whether these might be resonating with Neptune like uh, like we say they're supposed to and and so that's that's what we did we cloned a whole bunch of these objects within the uncertainty of their orbits and we integrated them out through the life of the solar system and okay. and in table uh, one the next table on the next page uh, we we detected um, around 10 Ooh, okay. that we think are in resonance with Neptune or likely are in resonance with Neptune. And before our paper, um, the furthest resonant object we thought we knew of was 2015 KE172 there in the 9 to 1, which we confirm. Yep. Uh, we also think it should be in the 9 to 1. Um, but we also found two... Uh, objects 2014 JW80 and 2014 OS394 that we think are most likely in the 10 to 1 and 11 to 1. So this again drives home that, you know, even in the past wow. five, 10 years, our surveys are starting to populate these distant resonances. And we're, we're much more likely to find more objects like 2014 OS394 that come within. 40 AU of the sun and are, are, are detectable for a big, big chunk of their orbit than, than said the like objects. So, so the, the main argument, the main kind of take home point of our paper is that um, in the, in the near future, we're hoping that finding more objects like these on the list here will really help us um, constrain, not just the planet nine hypothesis, but help us constrain a lot about Neptune's early evolution and the early formation um, of the solar system. Mm -hmm. So we were also curious because we had all these simulations, um, kind of to, to to finish up the discussion of, of the paper. We we're also curious, um, you know, do these objects resonate with Planet Nine as well? Can we use yes. um, the detected population of these distant objects to try and look for other other signals of planet nine. So if you go forward to this, uh, yeah, this planet, this figure nine, the figure after this one, we started to find a weird kind of crossover 
regime that was around objects with semi-major axis around 100 AU and perihelia a little further from Neptune, like 35 to 40 out to 45 AU. Okay. They can actually resonate with both Planet Nine and yeah. Neptune. So that was the first cool thing we found. So this this object here that we're plotting, and we had a, a few examples of this. Um, this one we chose to, sh to show. This object gets caught in Neptune's six to one resonance there on the, the top panel okay. in the beginning of the simulation. And it just so happens that its orbital shape is in a, in a configuration that we talked about earlier in that fourth panel that aligns with planet nine. And this, this alignment allows it to briefly fall into a 25 to two resonance with planet oh. nine. So, okay. so we also, from our, from our simulations, we, we found that there, there is this kind of crossover regime around uh, semi-major axes around 100 AU where you can get objects that are interacting with both Planet Nine and Neptune um, through their resonances. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final thing I'll show is if you go forward to the appendix, uh, we ran our same resonant detection algorithm. Um, instead of searching for objects in resonance with Neptune, we searched for objects in resonance uh, with planet nine and this figure here, um, figure figure 10 there that you're just on, yep. And you can see planet objects, particularly in the more distant Neptune resonance simulations, uh, 10 to one, 11 to one, 12 to one, and so on, they do get far enough out to fall into resonance with planet nine. This is nothing new, people have said this before. Um, but we also noticed that the most Populous resonance in our simulations by far is the one-to-one -one resonance. So these are these are objects that are in uh, so-called Trojan um, orbits with Planet Nine. People have also um, noticed this before, but you know we're just effectively pointing this out as well and kind of uh, uh, making the case that as we start to detect more objects like this. Uh, the biggest pattern we should be looking at is, is if there's a pattern of a whole bunch of objects around a certain semi-major axis, that would be a potential one-to-one -one, um, resonant population of Planet Nine. And these actually follow more exotic orbits than your, your typical Trojan orbit that you might have learned about, like uh, Jupiter's Trojans mm -hmm. uh, that orbit 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind. You go forward to the final set of two figures. So some of these objects, like the, the one plotted on the left of this pair of, of figures, figure 11, they do fall into the normal Trojan type orbits with planet nine. So you're seeing there on the bottom panel, um, this, this object here, maybe blue wasn't the best color here. Um, okay, there's blue. Pops into blue here. Oh, yes, I see. Nine's L4 um, population. Yeah. That's actually not the the dominant type of capture that you get with Planet Nine. Um, okay. the, the typical, you know, the, the, the typical way that, that you you solve this problem to kind of study Trojan orbits around Earth or Jupiter, or any of the, the the planets that that breaks down to these Lagrange points is assuming, you know, low eccentricities and circular orbits. And we were well out of that regime. So when you get well out of that regime into the very, very eccentric regime that all these objects are in, you get far more exotic um, orbits. So uh, a lot of these actually are in, in what's called quasi satellites. We know of a few near earth objects that, that are like this, where they're actually they're actually not 60 degrees or six behind or ahead. They're oscillating back and forth right on top of planet nine itself. So you can imagine what's being showed in this bottom plot here is basically just the angular difference in its orbit between the object and planet nine. Yeah. It, if you were standing on planet nine, it would almost appear from your vantage point as if this was a, a satellite going along with you oscillating back and forth. So mm -hmm. there's just some cool dynamics that we decided to throw in the appendix. Um, but the nice. main, main takeaway from our paper kind of is that, that, that table there um, summarizing the, the distant 
uh, resonant objects with Neptune that we've found so far. And we're really arguing that um, we're going to find a ton more of objects like this in the very near future. And this could be a very powerful constraint on the Planet 9 hypothesis and also a powerful constraint on our understanding of the early solar system. And that is my summary of the paper. Very cool. Matt, thank you so much for sharing your lovely article with us. Um, let me ask, because you touched it a few times, uh, particularly on the opposite, give it a future look. So you mentioned, you know, LSST is coming up, uh, you know, DECCAM is, is operational and there will be other ones as well. Um, so the observation is one, one direction for the future. Are there, are there other additional calculations that one could do? Uh, would, for example, it help to have 10 times as many uh, objects in the in-body simulations to reduce the error bars that were in, for example, figure one or something like that? Um, so just kind of give it a future look and where do, where do we go over the next, let's say, five years? Yeah, definitely, you know, going to higher resolution with increases in computing power is the way to go on all these these project these problems. Yeah. You know, a lot of groups are working um, in this manner. I myself have started using a GPU code Ooh. to to do these types of problems called G uh, Ganga, and it's it's perfect for a problem like this. Uh, so I highly recommend. It's it's written by Simon Grimm. Uh, it's starting to catch on. I highly recommend if you're doing um, end body work and you have access to GPUs, which I find are you know, in the clusters that I uh, I run on, um, I think people in other fields aren't, you know, rewriting their their codes um, for GPUs. And a lot of the, though they're more expensive um, as far as, you know, the, the wall time you're charged, I never wait for GPU nodes. They're always sitting yeah, there idle. Exactly, um, yes. So yes, going to, to higher resolution, reducing the error bars, having more particles is definitely the way to go. I also want to highlight a, a recent paper by um, Will Oldroyd that came out um, in the last few weeks, Oldroyd and uh, Trujillo. Um, it's called something like the, I actually don't know if it's in AA's journals or not off the top of my head, it's out of archive, but they're looking at that second part of the problem I talked about. We talked about the alignment of these objects. We also talked about their, their large perihelia um, and they're approaching the problem from the fact that there appears to be a, a gap in the distribution of these objects perihelia where there are really no objects known with perihelia between about 50 AU and 80 AU. And they show that this is statistically okay. significant and that planet nine could be an explanation for this. And if not planet nine, then another group should jump on and, and figure out another explanation for this right. perihelia gap that is statistically significant. So there's other, other ways definitely to jump in and try and constrain this problem um, dynamically that a lot of groups are working on. Uh, there are some, a couple other talks at the recent DDA um, Kaylee Anderson at uh, University of Oklahoma um, and my former group is working on something similar. She gave a talk at DDA um, talking about using the inclination distribution of the Kuiper belt to okay. constrain. There should be kind of a hole in the inclination distribution if there is planet nine. So there's, there's other dynamical ways people are looking at to constrain this problem. So there's, there's been a lot of cool work even in the last few months that's come out. Nice shout out. <laughs> Very good. I know Will is on the job market. <laughs> oh, 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 there we go. Okay, hires, beware. Um, awesome. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of very cool activity going over this over the next, let's say, five years or so. So it'll be very awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope this made your uh, astronomy day just a little bit better. And Matt, I want to thank you again. Thanks so much. It was great to be here. All Appreciate right. it. Bye, everyone. See you on the next one.